we call it the meat bag, the ambulance. Some guys, and uh, some of the guys gathered and people came down and took us out of there. So, but what I remember is as we drove through the head, and we were there, I don't know, we went out of one way. Father said, I look at him, it's a risk. And I said, yes, it's like it. That's the only exchange we knew. And I cannot say that I was terrified. I wasn't. When I was terrified, we were taken straight to the hospital on the station. And we spent the night there. They rang our station to tell them we were all right. And they said, okay, we send an aircraft to pick you up tomorrow morning. My father had another nurse to tell them the story. And I had nothing. And uh, we spent the night there. We sent an aircraft to pick us up. And the aircraft said, let's take a look see what you, where you people landed last night. They circled and we saw bits of wood from the mosquito hanging from trees and the mosquito down at the bottom of the spot. Then I was terrified. My pilot had a habit. When he had a bath, he would take in the bath room with him, a bottle of gin, some tonics, a packet of cigarettes, and a book. <laughs> And you would spend hours, you were not allowed in those days to have more than four inches of water in your bar. Because it feels so good. But the world would spend hours there. But this time I thought, the world is a little long in this bar. And it happened. I walked in the day he was sitting there in a day from this I rang the doctor immediately. He had delayed concussion. He was in Ely Hospital for two weeks after that. He delayed concussion. That cut really was a delayed concussion. And um, so those are two. Now, when nothing happens, and Berlin, where everything is bad, are the two things that I remember particularly. There was one other one. I went to my very first squadron reunion after the war, so the 19. The, sometime between 1979 and 1982, because I believe I, I, I knew that I was on the court of the people at the time. And, uh, oh, what a time. Oh, yes. I am a butterfly collector. And I have a collection of butterflies. In fact, the first birthday present I ever remember was from my uncle C.L. Williams. My sixth birthday, he gave me a butterfly net, and I started my collection there. When I went, I went around the world, and I came back, I thought, as a judge, I, start, I start, restarted a collection. The necessary people approached me to take pictures of my butterflies. So I said, and the Barkan collection was one we wanted, which was bought by Angus Sula. I said, go and talk to Angus Sula people. He did. And um, Angus said, no, they're not going to allow him to photograph their butterflies. So he came to me and said, I know you're a butterfly. I said, yes, thanks. He said, well, I want 24, pictures of 24 of your butterflies. And take a picture of it for next day. We're putting the 24 on the back of a condensed milk tin on the label. And you said, you pay $2 for the booklet. And I wrote a bit about each of the 24 butterflies on it, the feeding habits, the way you can find them, and the name, the no, the local name, and the Latin name. And that is how I went to my first squadron reunion. Because the message said, um, I asked them, who's writing the book for you? He said, well, we don't know. Would you like to do it? I said, fine. So I did it. And it was a holiday weekend, and I asked a friend of mine who had a house in Barbuda, can I go and spend it the weekend, holiday weekend, from Trinidad there, to write this next year book on Trinidad. But I nested it a series, I think, flowers, 
and stick the thing out and then butterfly the thing out of the blue. And I did that so I wrote it. Now the question is, let's say that how much are you going to charge? And now the question is, will the, uh, a judge has been reported to see what they've done, getting money to make a the concern. So I spoke to Chief Justice, who I was at the time, and 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 I was at the time, but I tell you what is, what is the rest of you? I said, you know, I just didn't like it for the first time I ever discovered where I am. And um, I would like to go to the first reunion, but I can't afford it. It's a long way. In those days, that is were very poorly paid. I can tell you, even both newspapers wrote editorials about judges' salaries. And um, a chap on the docks who said to George's brother-in-law told me, I mean, do you know that every CEO on the docks gets higher salary than Chief Justice? I said, I'm not surprised. <laughs> I think I got the salary at about $3,000 a month. Both newspapers, the Express and the Guardian, came out with editorial about judges' salaries. Anyway, so. What I would suggest is that I can send an invoice for doing the book and uh, charge them the same as a return air flight to London, which I did. And he said, I think that is settle everything. <laughs> and that's how I went to my first quarter reunion in London. Now, at that reunion, somebody came up to me. That I had flown with only one, he was not my regular pilot. That was Jack Moon. All right, do you remember this fight? You remember this fight? This is off? I said, what about this? He said, when you try to kill us? I said, how did I try to kill you? I was in the plane too, you know. Why was the right? I don't, I don't, I'm not suicidal. He said, he said, do you remember this? And then he told me, and then I remember it. I was bombing. And I had gone into the nose of the mosquito where the bomb site was. And we were trying to get the target. It was at night. Trying to get the target coming down the sand lines when we're going to And I said to him, sorry, Jaco, sorry, can't, you know, you tell the pilot, left a bit, left a bit, left, 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 no, 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 right, no, 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 straight, left. I said, sorry, Jaco, I missed it again, let, let, let's go around. He said, you did me that three times. He said, I thought you just trying to kill us. <laughs> but I, I was talking to another navigator, Yes, this is a couple of months ago. I said, you know, pilots must have had a thing that are hard done. They have nothing to do. <laughs> you this thing, this terrible thing with pilots, uh, where are we now? Eventually, my first pilot and I, we worked out the system. He, he, he is the one who started. There used to be a popular song called I wish I knew someone like me to help me. I remember it very well. So, whenever my... Where are we now? I would start singing, I wish I knew... And, <laughs> and he would join it, someone like you to love me. <laughs> and he would make a joke of it. Or I would say, since they asked you, where are we now? Really, I didn't know. As soon as I find out, you will be the first to know. <laughs> but, and, and you can understand, what's he doing? He's doing nothing. He's sitting there. He can't see any of night. He looks out for fighting. If you cone in search like that, or he has to get out of the search light. But otherwise, you, have to you are busy working. And you don't want to be interrupted every minute trying to find out where are we now. <laughs> But eventually you get a good relationship with your pilot, you have to. And I tell you about how this relationship exists. Some, sometimes you have a crew, one is an officer, one is a sergeant. And the pilot is an officer, the navigator is a sergeant, the vice versa. And you live living different messages. And there are only two of them on the And living in different messes, one is in the officer's mess, one is in the sergeant's mess. And, you know, that makes life a little difficult. So you tend to get very, very close to one of the people. Because I, I let you know, you're very close. We went into dinner 
at the Globe Hotel in King's Lynn one night. And we had dinner. There a bunch of us from the club, you know, ten of us. Some thousand, some of us. And we heard music, and if I was happening, we were singing. So we had to dance, so we had to dance, and then let's go to the dance. So after dinner, we walked up, got to dance, and the first thing we danced, said, I'm sorry, it's an officer's only dance, so I did not allow it. And we got very nasty about it. And we argued and argued. He said, no, I'm sorry, it's not the lounge. Of course, we'll come in the project time. So we went down to the lounge, we started drinking, and we drank too much. And we were, as we used to say in those days, we were getting very bullshit. I don't know who started it, but somebody decided to get our own battle with the hotel. I don't know who started it. All I do know is that somebody said, let's take that bloody radio and pick up the radio from the ground and put it back to the camp us. The next morning, I, I, I knew the CEO sent an orderly to call me to his office. I was still in bed. <laughs> and I knew, I saw, and I woke up and I saw the radio in my room. And all the, all the two detectives from Kingsland police had come in and I knew exactly what it was. I put the radio under my arm. Um, all they could say, they said that there was an officer with Trinidad on his shoulder among the crowd. That's the oath. They couldn't identify anybody except an officer with Trinidad on his shoulder. Well, I was the only officer in the with Trinidad on his shoulder. So I put the radio un under my arm um, and took it in the shoulder. She said, I presume, when he saw the radio, he said, you know it's about these, these are two detectives from King of England. You know exactly why they're here. I said, yes, sir. <laughs> yeah, he was very stupid, didn't he? I said, yes, sir. <laughs> and the people got to the radio. <laughs> and we, we shook hands with the two detectives and said, you know, you got to do this. Took the radio and said, that's your behavior. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but, but that shows, to some extent, the feeling you get when you are two people in there, one is a child, one is a brother, an officer. You know, you, you have a bond between you. Something you say, you can come in this dance for this one time, because it is tried from the children than your friends and your own. You know, and you, obviously, you are stupid. <laughs> but you can understand why you are stupid. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I don't know how long I have spoken for. Almost too long, I think. <laughs> uh, anyway, I thank you for listening so attentively. I don't have any questions you'd like to ask. If I can answer them, I will do so. Yes, the master bombings were mainly on land. Um, not, it would be very difficult to be a master bomber when there are only two of you. It would be very difficult. The navigator is really the dependent value of the navigator. And you need a, a, with a crew to find a target. It's not only if you have a crew, and if, if you, you, you read, um, Edmund Farfan's book. You haven't read Edmund's book. I, I find that book is so different. You know, having a crew of seven people is very different than having two thousand <laughs> you know, in, in the airplane world. You know, and I, when I, when I, I launched, Edmund, uh, Edmund asked me to launch his book, and this I did. And I said, you know, it's like comparing an old childless married couple to a couple with ten children. <laughs> ten children are a family. You know, but an old, chi a childless couple, two people. It, it, it's, it's a completely different sort of life, it's a complete reaction. And, and particularly, if you read Edwin Clarkson's book, you, know, you have to have a relationship with your flight engineer, your navigator, your mid-upper gunner, 
the Australian Charlie, the Australian Jana. You have to have a person. It is not the same as just having two panels. So, I, 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 I try to think, you know, what is it like to be in an airplane with six or seven other people? And, and, and everybody depending on everybody else. Everybody depending on everybody else. And especially to have, I mean, in, in line, we had seven people. You're going to have a few officers and you're going to have a few sergeants. And I think it's going to be very difficult maintaining a relationship in those circumstances with seven people. I don't know. I, I, I've never done this. I don't really know. But I, I do know that there are two of you who are virtually inseparable. Virtually inseparable. I have to. Oh, <laughs> well, I had to, well, you know, the real serious attempt. All three were murdered. Well, the, the woman who was doing it, me, was murdered. Her mother was murdered. Her brother in law was murdered. And in the corporate family, they were all murdered. We have mur in fact, what has happened was that we had had an election on the Monday night. And I always have a little small party on election night, watching the returns coming in. And uh, Lynette, who was doing it, and I knew her in London when she was a newsreader for BBC television. And she came here, sitting with her mother and her brother, you know, while Angela was in the Far East for the United Nations. And uh, she came and said, oh, this is a good opportunity now. To do your book. And I said, right, he went out and he bought a tape recorder, he bought a computer, and he started. He's working on it for two weeks. I had this party on the Monday night. She baked the carrot cake that she brought to the party. And she said, but we're not meeting tomorrow because I'm having, she had been a, a, an air hostess on duty. And she said, um, I'm having some of my friends from duty a tea tomorrow, Tuesday. We resume on Wednesday, that that time. On Wednesday, I rang, nobody answered the phone. I rang about three times, nobody answered the phone. It was very strange, I went and said, I their phone. And I was having lunch. I remember very well with one of the lawyers at the um, restaurant in Rust Street. And uh, I said to the no, my phone rang, it was Kathy Allen. Mrs. Allen rang and said that Sat Sharma is trying to get because Sat Sharma's wife had been a bursar on DWI and knew Lynette very well. Sat said he was trying to get Lynette and nobody seemed to be answering their phone. So I said, well, look, I'm going out to lunch now. I'm given the number and I gave her the number. So I said, this is the number. And I went out to lunch. And while I'd ordered the lunch, I had a lunch with a lawyer a minute ago. And uh, before we ordered lunch, I said before the lunch, somebody ring Kathy and see whether she started talking to her. So I rang Kathy Allen and she said, Yes, sir, the cat had started about two to me. You to pay yourself for that money. I said, What? Lynette, her mother, and her brother in law have all been murdered. I broke the lunch and jumped into my car and I went up straight to the house. The bodies were still there. I didn't see them. I didn't go to them. And, and we knew exactly when they were going to Because uh, once somebody who had been at the tea on the Tuesday went home, her mother had been with her at the tea and said, you know, I'm not doing dinner tomorrow. And her mother said, um, why are you doing it now? Why do you wait until tomorrow? And this was about 9 o'clock, uh, the tea party broke up about 7, and this was at 9. So we knew that she was murdered between 7 and 9. So they rang, and nobody wanted to see But the mother said, for well, they want to be tidying up after tea, they would never not be dead so soon. And we knew then that between 7 and 9 was ever murdered. Three of them. And uh, I had to read the eulogy to the next. I 
Done. What I'm trying to do at the moment is to write bits and pieces. For example, somebody said that they can face one of the things that I have in my mind to write it. Um, Christmas in Timbuktu, because I did spend Christmas and I need to see it in Timbuktu, and I've written that up. And the other one is an evening with Mr. Sacker before she was Prime Minister. I didn't write it to work. I do bits and pieces and see if I can get into the doing a biography. Yes? The previous Minister of National Security asked me the same question when he was in office. And I said, be happy, don't worry. He said, in my job? <laughs> that was his reply. Be happy, don't worry, in my job? <laughs> ah, why did, you volu why did I volunteer, personally? There was conscription in England. You were bound to join the forces if you are over 18. There was conscription. But, you are not bound to be air -free. The RAF said, anybody who gets into the air, it's a highly dangerous job. I mean, it is. You don't actually expect to come out of the air. But let me put it this way. It's not something that worried you. But I occasionally, uh, if it flashed through your mind, and what is flashed through my mind, I wonder whether I would ever see my 28th birthday. And I was 28 on the 1st of May 1945, and the war ended seven days later, so I knew I would see my 29th birthday. Uh, unless I got run over by a bus in Piccadilly. <laughs> Why can't she, uh, does she speak? <laughs> Why can't she ask a question herself? Why does she have to have a surrogate? Oh, but, but wait a minute, you know, this is a good thing. Kenrick Rawlins and I, when we were, we were doing one course, I think the Cranwell course we did together. And A, depending on the ignorance of the English, we decided, Kenrick was a very tall chap, he was 62, and very, and not garrulous like me. So we decided that Kenrick was an African prince, and I was his spokesman. <laughs> we started, started early on, because we, when we first were, when we first went, the area application of all those beautiful flats around Regent's Park, the area cadets, and you wore a little white flat to show you an air two cadets in your forest town. And they'd take me away. And the first morning when we got our un uniforms, we went on our civilian, got our uniforms, and the first morning we were there, we, were, we ate at the zoo, and we were paid at Lord Spirit Ground. <laughs> and the first morning we were there, make your beds, everybody, a little cockney corporal thing. Now, I had never made a bed in my life, neither had Kendrick Rowling. So, we looked at these, and what, what happened was we had things that they called biscuits. Your bed was in four things, and they were all four on a pile with a blanket on them. And you had to put the pile, the, the four biscuits down. Anyway, so, you need a coffee. Why have you made your bed? But we don't know how to make the bed. Corporal. Well, well, you better make your bed. Otherwise, I'll get in the chair. I thought a little corporal said. So we still didn't know how to make a bed. 
so we started looking at the bed and he came and said, okay, I'm going to make the bed today. Eh? And from now on, look, see what I do. He made our bed every morning. <laughs> 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 they, they really didn't know what to do with it. <laughs> uh, yeah. and, and, and going to any town in England in those days, every schoolboy, especially when school is over, but they're all going to stop you to ask you the time. They only want to see you speak. Some of them never spoke to the black person in their lives. This is 1941, you know. And they all wanted to know the time. All I want to do is just say what language we're speaking. <laughs> yes? Here, well, I recently amended this venture. <laughs> No, 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 no. Once the war was over, I considered that's what I went for, it's over, right. Let me, that I, I, well, I did my law in England immediately after the war. See? Why did I do law? Well, I thought it would be easier than working for a living. I was right. I still, yes, it's fading a bit now, but I, I, I did write the Butterfly Connection, and the, the, the book was sold, I think the, book, the booklet was sold for two dollars, and you had to buy your, do you remember it? You remember it, really? And, yes, yes, oh yes, is, is it, you have a copy? Because I've been looking for one. Kenyon and Eckhart, and Eckhart were the um, advertising agency who did it, and they did, on the back of the book that they do, they did say it was done by me. Ah, uh, I actually really enjoyed doing it. I, I really enjoyed it. Couldn't believe, I couldn't believe they actually paid me to do something I enjoyed doing. <laughs> I don't know how many things they made you have to buy to get, the, to get all the pictures. <laughs> And there were 24 pictures, and I didn't see some feet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You bought the book for two dollars, you have to buy the milk to see if you get the, the picture of all those 24 pictures at the back of the, la the label of the condensed chain. Yeah, yeah. I don't know how many people have ever, I don't know how much money people have to spend just to buy all this milk. <laughs> but you know, you know, keep talking about condensed milk. I am diabetic, so I, I don't, I don't, I don't use condensed milk. Sweetened condensed milk. But it's really interesting. When I was a child, I said the first day I earn my own money, I am going to buy a hot bread take the fish out and pour a tin of sweetened condensed milk <laughs> in it. <laughs> I've never done it, but I've always thought as a child, ah, that is just like going to heaven. <laughs> I know the movement talk about having 72 virgins or something. I thought filling a hot bread with condensed milk was my idea of heaven. <laughs> no? Any more questions? Thank you very much indeed. Thank you for listening to attending me. Thank you.